What's going on, peeps? On my episode, The Appeal of AGR, by far the most requested band was a band called Tally Hall, a band so influential that they made a museum named after their first album. <laughs> what am I doing here? First of all, I'm rocking with the suits, man. Bunch of geeks, bunch of nerds. Was this AGR before AGR? Just some white boy magic? Now, I'll admit it, I've never listened to this band before. This is the first musical act in this series where I can state that I had never listened to any music they put out before I went on this deep dive. I was familiar with the name, mainly thanks to Brad. He wasn't much of a fan, and based on their overall reception, they seem to be mixed critically. But their fan base seems so so die hard to the point where they'll wait how many years for another album? That's right, I was shocked to find out that this group only has two albums. One in 2005 and 2011. The reason why there was such a gap will be answered momentarily. But I think it's clear that there is appeal to this band, making them perfect for my world famous series, The Appeal. This series is dedicated to covering controversial or divisive musical acts and creators to find out why people enjoy them as much as they do. I recognize the divisiveness, despite not hearing a single song. So let me listen to them first so we can really start. Oh wow, okay. Well that's... Well that's Tally Hall. <laughs> that's a lot to process. Okay, so based on that debut album alone, I have paragraphs to write about for this video, I can't lie y'all. I kinda dig this band. I don't know how often I'll return to their albums, but I very much respect the vision they had. I guess it helps that I'm a white boy from Michigan. <laughs> anyway, enough yapping, I think it's time we find the aspects about this band that are hidden in the sand to explain the appeal of Tally Hall. The story of Tally Hall begins in Andover High School, where the guitarist Rob Cantor, bassist but drummer at the time Zubin Seji, and their high school friend Zach Craftsman initially formed a band named Listed Black in 2001. They successfully compiled an EP named Songs About Girls, featuring songs like Yearbook, which eventually made its way onto the Tally Hall Pingree EP. The band split in 2002 after Cantor and Seji graduated from high school and moved to Ann Arbor. The two attended the University of Michigan together. There they met keyboardist Andrew Horowitz to form another band in December. The three played small shows for Michigan dorms, the first being at the Fres building in Ann Arbor. Cantor then met guitarist Joe Holly, who was friends with their housemate Andrew Larick. Holly had a film production trope at college called Anonymous that Cantor became a part of. Both sat next to each other in their musicology course. From their Cantor convinced Holly to join the band. At first they called themselves Gallagher or 540, their home address. They eventually settled with Tally Hall, named after the food court that contained Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum. This museum would soon inspire their debut album. More people joined the lineup such as a producer Bora Karaka and drummer Steve Gallagher, who was replaced by current drummer Ross Felderman. With a stacked lineup, it was time to start recording music in Holly's Attic. In there, they recorded their first song as a band yearbook in the Party Booby Trap EP in April 2003, including four demos with three of them eventually being included on their debut album. They began playing local shows in 2003 and 2004 throughout Ann Arbor. Their first chance at more broad exposure was on May 7, 2004 when they played on the Mitch Album Show. The Pingree EP was put out on May 13, 2005 that featured demos and recordings of their earlier live performances. The band continued to tour throughout their hometown area and signed to Quack media to finance their debut album. This record was teased on their MySpace and made sure to keep their fanbase updated through their website. Finally, their debut album Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum was released November 12, 2005. In 2006, they embarked on their residency tour in April and served as an opening act for Japanese pop duo Ami Yumi. Their music caught the attention of Alexandra Patsavas, the music coordinator for the OC, leading to the inclusion of their songs in the television series. This exposure expanded their reach into popular culture. The Day After Tomorrow featured Good Day, the Dream Lover featured Hidden in the Sand. Additionally, MTV's The Real World Key West used Banana Man as the theme song for a character named Johnny Bananas. 
The band's popularity reached a boost after radio host Matthew Moeller recommended their album to the late night host Craig Ferguson. This led to Tally Hall's performance of Good Day on the Late Late Show on August 2nd, 2006. A month later, on September 12th, 2006, there was a re-release of Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum, garnering national attention, including an appearance on MTV's You Hear It First. By March 2007, they inked their first major label deal with Atlantic Records and proceeded to re-record their debut album. So it was reissued for a third time on April 1st, 2008, after granting permission from Atlantic Records. Craig Ferguson invited Tally Hall once again onto the Late Late Show on September 16th, 2008, to boost the popularity of the Tally Hall Internet Show, a 10-part variety show series that aired on their website featuring comedy sketches and music videos. Now, the fans anticipated a new album, but they would have to wait quite a while. They planned to record new material in the summer of 2009, but these plans were delayed. Instead, they continued to tour and unveiled a new single, Light and Night, featuring Nicole McKay. In 2010, they went on a joint tour with Jukebox, The Ghost, and Skybox. Bro, some of these names are like ridiculous, come on. <laughs> Unfortunately, Holly decided to back out of the tour out of nowhere. Their touring member and friend Casey Shea replaced Holly. He wasn't out of the band though, just taking a mental health break. In March 2011, the band confirmed the original members were still together. Later in the same year, the group transitioned management from the Hornblow group to Stiletto Entertainment. And finally, on June 21st, 2011, they introduced their second and last album, Good and Evil. Following the release of Good and Evil and its corresponding tour ending on August 20th, 2011, Tally Hall entered a period of inactivity, with each band member pursuing individual projects. Joe Holly would later collaborate with Boron Ross and formed Miracle Musical and Hawaii Part 2. Rob created Not a Trampoline and contributed to songs for The Ghost and Molly McGee. Andrew produced Sketches and Sketches 3D, Ross has the Mr. F mixtapes, and Bora leads his own band, Kojum Dip. Since then, there has been no new music release or live shows from the band. And the biggest surprise would be the fact that they've gotten even more popular since their hiatus. Seven years later, in 2018, they surpassed 100,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. This number would get even higher in the next two years after the bidding and hidden in the sand went viral on TikTok. This allowed the band to surpass a million monthly listeners for the first time. Through this viral moment, they earned themselves a new generation of fans wanting to figure out who Tally Hall is. Here comes the video essays like mine. They explore every aspect of the band they never knew about. And in 2024, they are now sitting at 4 million monthly listeners without any new music in 13 years. They're on an indefinite hiatus. Yeah, just like Rihanna is recording an album. There has been indications from members about a potential third album. Holly has been battling with an unknown mental illness that has pushed back any plans for like over a decade now. While Sedgi playfully suggested a return might happen if they amassed 30 or 40 million monthly listeners, as mentioned in the statement for Spotify Wrapped, basically, they probably aren't coming back. <laughs> The first thing I want to discuss about their music that makes them pretty likable to me is their sense of humor. I love the fact that Tally Hall doesn't take themselves seriously and puts the best factors of that humor into their music, such as catchiness and charm. Starting fresh on Welcome to Tally Hall, it's a playful song that decides to break the fourth wall talking about is my amp too high? Then there's moments where Joe Holly becomes British? This isn't even the stupidest idea. To Love is about the band's infatuation with the Olsen twins. <laughs> it turns out people were in love with Mary, Kate, and Ashley during this era in pop culture. I guess Kanye wasn't alone. This is a whole new level of parasocial similar to that song about the Kardashians, Chloe, you're the one I want. I Okay, this song is obviously satirical though. Nobody admits to enrolling in the same school or hanging around their apartments to get closer to a girl. They would get a restraining order for that. Plus, one of the twins is credited in the interlude, so they're in on the joke too. And despite being a joke, you gotta admit, even Banana Man is stupidly catchy. Sounds like something you'd hear in the 70s with its over-the-top presentation. Do you want the banana? Do you want the banana? 
something you'd sing over the campfire or hear in a Disney movie for children. Afri can't you tell me told you so? Wait, is this kind of racist? <laughs> Look, I've seen people calling this racist, then say it's about a drug addiction. No, it's about consumerism. But no, 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 you're wrong. It's about nothing, just like good day. Based on these responses, Tally Hall's music has a bunch of layers where the meaning isn't entirely confirmed. It's up to us to interpret what these strange songs mean. If I'm being honest, I don't know if this is a hot take, I might get cancelled for this. I kinda love this song, and I just want to imagine it's about some person who loves bananas. The sound of this is just too irresistible for me not to like. It's comfort music. I'm digging this accent they're going for. Reminds me of Ocean Man by Ween. There goes my credibility. There are also two bonus tracks Mucka Blucka and Dream. Mucka Blucka might be their most ambitious track yet, consisting of nearly two minutes of a chicken solo. What else can I say? They don't take themselves seriously. Dream follows it up as a pure acapella song, something you'd hear while you're dreaming. Also, we'll tack on that cover of Just a Friend by Biz Markey. I think they pulled it off pretty well, it's got that white boy swagger. Speaking of covers, this also exists. So I love the original Club Can't Handle Me. This certainly doesn't do it justice. They turned it from a club banger to tutorial music. But don't worry guys, it means nothing. I like to say hello and welcome you, good day that is my name. I want to talk more about this nothingness to their lyrics. They have several songs about topics that make next to no sense. Just look at the lyrics for the opener, Good Day. This just seems like a bunch of run-on sentences that just lead to nothing. The track is about nothing. It's pretty much just up for us to decide. Only proven with the lyric, this song is about a no or yes or why. You know when Fall Out Boy throws out a bunch of word salad in their songs? I'm getting similar vibes. It's a solid introduction to the album and you can just expect more ideas like this. They come back to the theme on Good and Evil. Who you are confuses me. I'm trying to wrap my head around on what this even means. Does he have a crush on a girl and wishes to know who she is? Like every Tally Hall song, this could have more of a different meaning. Haven't put all the pieces in place yet. I think by far the most telling part of their discography is at the very end of their first album. There's a reverse sample of Marvin Yagoda on Hidden in the Sand stating, wouldn't the world be better off if we took nonsense seriously? Because this album on the surface portrays this innocent, silly, simple presentation, but the lyrics could be more complicated than we truly understand. There's just something so pure about this simple simplistic nonsense ridiculous nature of these songs that might have a bigger meaning if you look more in depth. It really gives fans a lot to think about, you know, it makes them want to return to the record more often and try to dissect like every mini detail and I think that's why they have such a cult following. It's pretty genius. I can definitely see why AJR fans wanted me to review this band. Tally Hall all around has an innocent, pure nature to their music. They don't cuss or talk about super explicit subjects. The band just seems like a bunch of church boys making music. Being very clean and cut has essentially become their brand. On November 9, 2003, Tally Hall placed an order for the distinctive colored ties that would later become iconic. They initially paired these ties with white dress shirts in November 2003, opting for these uniforms as a way to stand out from other college bands and symbolize their unity as individuals and musicians. They are presented as a bunch of middle school band geeks with no real life experience. But they don't just appeal to middle schoolers in this instance. When you listen to the music, they could also appeal to children. Be Born takes on a more warm, folk sound, likely because it's about a literal birth. The mother is trying to tell the baby to swim in the direction of her voice, essentially out of her womb. It's cute, has an innocent and pure sound to it. Haku is another soft coffee shop rhythm about creating a love poem to someone but failing to stick the landing. When I was first listening to this album, I thought to myself, was Tally Hall ever licensed for a Disney movie? The whole world and you would be perfect. The clapping, audience singing along, the upbeat fun nature and playful lyrics, it's very innocent sound. I later found out, after listening to this album, that Tally Hall indeed performed songs for the children's television show Happy Monster Band, aired by Disney Junior. I called it! 
Spring and Storm continues in the Tally Hall formula where the vocals and instrumentals are musically pleasing yet the lyrics are confusing and almost meaningless? Or are they? Any song that has blah 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 on it is probably nothing. However, if you analyze it a bit deeper, the song tackles the conversation about nature and its cycle, the effect it has on humanity, and recognizing we are part of the cycle. On the demo version of this track, a funny part included is on the bridge where Rob and Zubin are portrayed as children asking the moon, aka Joe about the sky. I wonder if a kindergarten teacher has used this song for their class. It'd fit right in. They had actual children play the part. Him for a scarecrow is pretty pure too. Holly wrote about his fascination with a scarecrow's feelings and wonders. I thought AGR was childish. Tally Hall takes it to a whole different level, but there's another thing they have in common. If you can tell already, you never really know what Tally Hall will present you next. They display this out the gate. Good Day will certainly get your attention. It's a weird one where each section sounds completely different from the past section. You open with a piano and boy band harmonies that switch to hints of a hard rock guitar breakdown before being like, psych, acoustic guitar. Expect the unexpected. And yeah, it's very, very white. But that's okay, I enjoy 20 on Pilots, I'm used to this. Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum is such a wild record because you'll go from absolute chaos to straight humming. Seriously, is the bidding where Kid Cudi got the idea to start humming in his music? I kind of recognize this song. Oh, it went viral on TikTok in 2019, that makes sense. I completely understand why it's one of their most popular tracks. It certainly has a broad appeal to it and a shiny melody. The whole bidding here is on men. That's right, it's a dating market. But just like all those dating apps, nobody ends up satisfied of true love. Sorry, y'all. It's more about the chase and that brag of being able to capture a partner similar to Sold by John Michael Montgomery. In other words, I'd rather remain single than use these methods. Fun song, though. I didn't predict that Cantor would start rapping on Welcome to Tally Hall. Picture it as the whitest, nerdiest guy you know busting a rhyme. I think it works better on Ruler of Everything, a pretty cool track about time being the controller of our lives. This is expressed through the progressive use of a more slow, steady intro until it transcends into a fast, rapid-paced rapping segment that actually works in the context. It's not like those lyrical miracle rappers trying to show how fast they can rap. I wish the lyrical topics on Good and Evil were this lively, but they certainly come out of nowhere. The trap compares the real world to the digital world where the takeover of technology is drifting people away from reality, trapping us. Didn't expect to get political on a tally hall track. Plus, Misery Fell is more of a criticism of people who rely on religion to find peace. Hey, what's dang, are y'all talking about me? Turn the Lights Off is about puberty, where the kid is struggling with his new body, but later learns to accept who he is. If you're comparing their two albums, the difference in maturity is a bit of a whiplash. Let's talk about those records more in depth. Tally Hall only released two albums in their nine-year career, with the exception of five EPs and two compilation demo albums. These two records are 2005's Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum and 2011's Good and Evil. Both records had some sort of concept that the listener would follow along with as they heard the record. But did you know that their debut album is named after an actual real-life museum in Farmington Hills, Michigan? They even got approval to use their logo for the album. I had the time to visit the arcade museum myself as it was only two hours away from my hometown and I was completely overwhelmed by how much there was to do. Maybe I'm just an introvert. It still appears to be a popular attraction in the Michigan area. If you're looking to take someone on a cute date, <laughs> this is a fun location. But as I said before, I was overwhelmed by the amount of machines, visuals, animatronics, and games available. An experience similar to when I was listening to this album because I was overwhelmed by how many ideas this band was throwing at me just in the opening track. The feeling of this album is supposed to be similar to the feeling you would have if you were at this museum. It captures that feeling shockingly well. You can tell these boys grew up going to this attraction and being immersed by its magic back when it was part of Tally Hall until 1988. This story is being told on Welcome to Tally Hall which serves as an introduction to the band in general. I feel like it would have worked more as an intro to the album instead of Good Day. The song introduces Cantor, Sedgi, and Holly as attractions at Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum. The band was obviously influenced by its founder, Marvin, so he's going to be referenced and sampled a few times in this project. Like on Taken for a Ride, 
that sees Marvin questioning his life choices and overall happiness, matching the song's overall discussion about one's depression. I also hear the retro video game sound effects placed throughout these tracks, a clear reference to the museum's vast array of arcade games. Towards the end of the album, there's a reverse sample of Marvin stating, wouldn't the world be better off if we took nonsense seriously? As I've discussed before, where the songs adopt a non-sensual tone or playfully mock themselves, yet upon closer evaluation of the apparent absurdity, one could uncover profound underlying meanings throughout much of the album. Their biggest song, Hidden in the Sand, was originally a hidden track. It's a story of cheating where this man feels like his woman and him are perfect together, but Hidden in the Sand is that the woman was falling in love with another man. It is a lot more relaxed in comparison to the rest of the album. It's EQ'd in a way where it sounds like it's coming out of a radio based in the 1960s. It feels old-fashioned and vintage, almost as old as this museum. This record feels nostalgic about those innocent times until Tally Hall was closed down and they had to deal with the fact that they were getting older. The character appears to be growing as each track passes. It's like a walk down memory lane. Their second album, Good and Evil, is more straightforward. The track and pretty much explains the concept of this record, duality, addressing several forms of opposites of each other. However, they're still somewhat connected with each other, such as Night and Day, and Words and Numbers. They serve a similar mission with a different result. This is what we call balance. It focuses on this woman named Big Bad Betty of the Apocalypse. This lady is later referenced on the one minute cut A Lady. You and Me follows this theme of two things coming together and serving a purpose. The relationship starts off hopeful, but leads down a path of division and hardship. Both struggle to get along. One day they're fine, and the next day it's back and forth. He talks about seeing these abusive and toxic signs since the beginning, but he ignored them out of love. Now he wonders if that was a mistake because of Cannibal. The man finds himself comparing his lover to a cannibal that is tearing him apart. So what does he decide to do about it? He does nothing. He accepts it and is fine with it? He's a willing victim of a cannibal. In my humble opinion, this is not a good way to handle an abusive relationship. I don't care how good the sex is. Fate of the Stars is the one track that appears to break this theme, likely because it's the concluding track. There's multiple movements throughout. There are changes, breaking this balance of song structures being similar similar for practically the entire album. It makes references to other songs on the album, serving as a finale just right. It's a much mature effort in comparison to their debut. These themes make the album seem more like a mystery that needs to be analyzed and decoded. I can see why the band has diehard fans despite not dropping new material in a decade. There are meanings behind these songs that still haven't been cracked yet. When it comes to putting together a story to go along with their music, Tally Hall absolutely nails it on the head. And the music itself? When it comes to Tally Hall's musicianship, I really don't have a lot of complaints. The charming delivery, infectious and catchy melodies, wonderful harmonies, and colorful, passionate singing from each member, they all come together to produce some great sounding stuff. The guitar and drum work is funky, fun, but sometimes wonky or off kilter. They don't stick to just one genre, however. One Day is a piano driven pop rock track with some lush harmonies and smooth instrumental switch ups. I can see the theater core musical and I guess AGR comparisons here. Taken for a Ride has elements of synth pop led by this almost robotic vocal tone. With lyrical topics about depression, I see this as a creative decision to attempt to show no emotion to illustrate that depressing state they're in. Greener follows more of a pop rock formula, rattling guitars with a few bell chimes. It's got QC lyrics about missing a person that is no longer in their life. Cantor isn't happy about this feeling, where even a phone call sounds too distant. It plays on that term, the grass is always green on the other side. In this case, this girl is on the other side. She moved on, and Cantor feels everything would be better if they just stayed together. He certainly betrays this angst in his performance. You'll get over eventually. Once you get into good and evil, the opener Never Meant to Know feels rather tame for a Tally Hall song. It's not as chaotic as the previous record. It's a lot more simplistic. There's a relaxed vocal tone in soft rock instrumental with a few buzzing synth added in. This is a reflection on how you may have questions that you're never meant to 
know the answer behind. Sound-wise, it's pretty much the same throughout with well-balanced guitars, strings, and drums. Not a whole lot of experiments in comparison to their debut. They are generally talented musicians and you can tell they loved making music together. There's this mix of happy, upbeat, nonsense songs that give the listener a sense of joy and freeness, but there's also the more downbeat, depressing ballads that inform the listener that they aren't alone in their struggles and that they can make it through together. They've left such a great impression on people with only two albums. We can't forget about those vlogs, skits, and webisodes that allowed their fans to get to know Tally Hall more. The music videos are also just weird, ridiculous, relatable, and very, very late 2000s. It's like they were an internet band before it was cool to use the internet to promote your music. That indie band you won't hear on the radio. There's hours of Tally Hall video content if you're looking for a late 2000s nostalgia rush. Look at the way their website is designed, so mysterious. They have a great vision of artistry and their musicianship is certainly respectable. I can see why their fans miss them. You hang around for a living. I am in love with Tally Hall because their music style is so incredibly cool, goofy, and catchy all at once. Their singing voices are so good and perfect and work perfectly together. The small details in every song that makes you want to replay the songs over and over again. The instruments, the sound, the quality is all perfect. The creativity is insane, I just love them so much. Their songs make me so happy and they're the people that keep me going. Even as people I love them. Maybe not much Joe right now though. but when he was just goofy and kind. And they're also the people that made me more interested in singing more because their songs are so singable, you know? I used to love to sing when I was a little kid, but as I got older, I stopped singing as much, but now I sing almost every single day and I love it. I love how many of the band members do their music writing. It never gets boring or feels like it's repetitive, and they write on such a wide range of random themes. They always look like they're having a genuine good time in their performances, and this is still so funny. All of them are genuinely amazing amazingly skilled musicians. I think their music sounds really cool. Some of their songs are goofy and have that late 2000s, early 2010s vibe that makes them feel kind of nostalgic. I like how their more serious songs aren't edgy and you can actually relate to them. They act like actual young adults, late teens, who decide to start a band. They have their quirky and a bit cringy humor, behave like normal people, and don't try to act so serious. If you gather all Tally Hall related albums and songs, you can get a pretty long playlist. Each of these albums has its own style and vibe, so you can find Tally Hall related songs to listen to that would fit your current mood. You could also feel like each song is made with passion and love for what they're doing. I love their music so much, but a major part of why I like them so much is because of the Bora logs and this. Because I watched those before I started listening to their music. They have such a great form of comedy, especially the 20 question skit. I really like the experimental and goofy part of Tally Hall, and the songs are just really well made. They have no missing components. Sometimes I just like to put on headphones and dive into the Tally Hall music world. You can literally feel like you're in this song that you're listening to. Contrary to what many people will try to tell you, Tally Hall isn't exactly a special band. People will say that they try to be different, didn't care about being famous, and generally love their fans. All of which is true, but isn't necessarily unique by itself, and isn't the whole reason why I like them so much. What I love is that they were a group of young friends messing about, but because they were so genuinely talented, they were able to actually succeed. In terms of music, I love that Tally Hall's non-serious songs hide the mean for ones. I love the fact that a lot of their music is simply fun to listen to and isn't trying to be anything more, while some of the songs generally do have a message to decipher. My two all-time favorite songs from Tally Hall are Ruler of Everything and Fate of the Stars, due to the care that was put into the lyrics and the music. With Fate of the Stars, even the structuring of the song feeds into the potential story that it tells, just like any good poem. Another very prominent factor for me is the fact that lots of their work in the surrounding works of Joe Holly and Miracle Musical hasn't been very very deeply explored. There has been no clarification for what the songs mean and no real group of experts that can decide. The experts are just people who like the music. We all listen to music and find our own interpretations, but often upon looking up what the song means, those can be shut down. I don't find that with Tally Hall. Even when it comes to Miracle Music, which features a genius page that explains the storyline of the whole album, 
I'm not disheartened. Hawaii Part 2 is made to be interpreted differently by everyone, and that makes listening to the songs very refreshing. If I had to summarize why I like Tally Hall, I would say it's because they are unsuspecting. You get to know one side of the band members through this and the Boralogs, and then get to know the complete other side from their music. You listen to Banana Man and simply don't expect that another one of their songs could follow a deeply unique story, yet Fate of the Stars does. Tally Hall is a band that you get to know more about the more you listen to them, and everyone goes through stages of being a Tally Hall fan. That's why there's such a crossover between Tally Hall and Miracle Musical. The music itself isn't similar at all, but the passion and the personality is felt. In modern day pop, that's very hard to find. If any other band made a song that sounds like Too Love, I would probably be caught dead before listening to it. But Tally Hall isn't any other band. They're Tally Hall. It might not be special that they tried to be special, but it's special that they managed to succeed without compromising anything. And it just goes to show that the band truly was composed of unique members who had genuine passion for music. <laughs> They're white and the fans are annoying. Thanks for the video. Okay, let's be serious. I feel like people don't like Tally Hall for the same reason someone would hate AJR. They make off-kilter, nonsensical, awkward, and stupid music. And they know that. Not everyone will realize that and write them off completely as just another white Christian choir boy theater core group. It's not music to play around the homies unless they're open-minded, already fans of the group, or children. Normal people don't just like Banana Man. I'm not a normal person so I like it. Some people think that song is racist because it talks about someone who likes bananas. It must be about a black person! An assumption that is low-key racist in itself. Anyway, that's probably why someone wouldn't like that song or they just think it's childish and stupid, like most of their songs. I think they have a few awkward creative decisions though. The rapping from Cantor on Welcome to Tally Hall is pretty damn corny, wasn't a fan. As I mentioned, Taken for a Ride is almost robotic sounding vocally, makes it sound emotionless. It's done on purpose to demonstrate that depression, but it still doesn't mean I like how it sounds. Just Apathy is just another miserable state of mind where this man is like a hopeless romantic that appears to be screwing up every relationship he gets in and wonders if dating is even worth it anymore. Not a base perspective, bro. These ideas are stupid, but at least they're entertaining to watch and not boring. This is the biggest problem I have with Good and Evil. These instrumentals, while they sound nice, they are all sounding the same and lead into to each other. Plus, what is the auto-tune on the bridge of Sacred Beast and further on after that? Not a great touch. At least turn the lights off is somewhat interesting despite the dated ear-piercing sims that drown out everything around it. I just don't have much to say about the songs here, such as Out in the Twilight and You. Like, cool, you can see more things now that there's Twilight. Cool! Fate of the Stars feels like a breath of fresh air in comparison. In conclusion, I was disappointed with Good and Evil. They seemingly turned down the weirdness and uniqueness of that previous record. The vocals were good, don't get me wrong, but if we were to go into this album blind without knowing who the band is, it sounds more like a Weezer and AGR crossover adventure. I know the album was about balance balance and stability, but that doesn't mean everything had to sound the same! It didn't make for an interesting record in my opinion. While there were stupid ideas on the last album, at least there was some charm to it. This is just a little too calm. If Light and Night was on this album, maybe I'd like it a bit more. That one's actually pretty awesome. Another huge reason people have turned against Tally Hall is because of Joe Holly. This has nothing to do with the music itself, but the allegations that have been presented against the guitarist. If you don't want to hear about this, skip here. What happened is that Holly was accused of inappropriately influencing a teenager, sexualizing a minor, transphobia, a lot of their fans are LGBTQ, and racism. Now, a lot of people blame Holly's ongoing struggle with mental illness and getting way too drunk to the point he starts messaging fans without a filter. The dude clearly needs help, and I hope he's getting it. There's there's a lot of dark and disturbing stuff in this 30 page document. I don't think I'm the right person to try and explain everything. I only heard about this incident while researching for this video. I'm sure there are more credible people out there like Tally Ball that can break this down better as they actually actively follow the band. I don't want to accidentally spread misinformation, but if you or someone you know is a victim of similar abuse, 
I hope you get the justice you deserve. Tally Hall is a fascinating band, and I almost wonder what they could have been if they continued to make music. Would they be as big as AGR or 21 Pilots? I guess we'll never know. Anyway, this band became so loved for their stellar musicianship, clever concepts, unpredictability, sense of humor, pureness, and free-spirited nonsense. There's a lot of reasons to like and dislike the group. I hope it presented their appeal well and gave outsiders an understanding on why someone would enjoy this band. I certainly respect the group a lot. I love Banana Man, Ruler of Everything, The Bidding, and Late and Night. I was most definitely taken for a ride throughout this musical journey. Thanks for watching this video. Let me know which group I should talk about next. I'm likely going to be doing one on Toil and Pilots in May. Prepare for an hour-long video essay. I'm not even kidding. I have too much to say. Other than that, feel free to subscribe, like, and share the video. I worked pretty hard on it. I'll see you all in the next one. Make sure to love all in peace. I'm